further ado, Catherine. Thank you, Yankee. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are going to be looking at when General Ulysses S. Grant expelled the Jews. Historians used to tra trace the roots of American anti-Semitism to the post-war, post-Civil War period, usually to 1877, when the Jewish banker Joseph P. Seligman, a good friend of U.S. Grant's, was refused entry to the Grand Union Hotel in Saratoga Springs, New York, because he was Jewish. During the war, however, it's clear that Northerners and Southerners alike used Jews as a convenient scapegoat for the social and economic woes of the times, which the war exacerbated. No era, of course, is free of anti-Semitism, but there was most definitely a surge of anti-Jewish feeling and behavior during the war years, as can be seen by the plethora of anti-Semitic cartoons, political cartoons, in newspapers and periodicals of the time. As the war dragged on and as the fabric of the South began to unravel, the dreams of easy victory turned to nightmares of blood, death, and destruction. And the nation, at its darkest moment, erupted in an explosion of anti-Semitism as never seen before in America. The South lay in ruins, scorched, plundered, and blockaded, so that its economy, based on cotton, tobacco, and rice production, was in turmoil, and its currency worthless. Along the Mississippi River Valley, thousands of bales of cotton lay on plantations and in warehouses, an easy target for speculators, Yankee soldiers, and smugglers. On the 17th of December, 1862, Major General Ulysses S. Grant, from his headquarters at Holly Springs, near Oxford, Mississippi, issued General Orders Number 11. Holly Springs, a vast supply depot, lay in the Department of the Tennessee, which was Grant's war zone. Now, this department, this chunk of land, was enormous. It ran from, ran from Cairo, Illinois, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Mississippi to the Tennessee rivers. Enormous. This lay under his sole control. His word was law for both military personnel and civilians alike. The order read as follows. The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also department orders, are hereby expelled from the department within 24 hours from the receipt of this order. Post commanders will see that all of this class of people be furnished passes and be required to leave, and anyone returning after such notification will be held in confinement until an opportunity occurs of sending them out as prisoners, unless furnished with a permit from headquarters. No passes will be given these people of making personal application for trade purposes by order of Major General Ulysses S. Grant. Fortunately, this disastrous order 24 hours to pack up families, babies, old people, the bedridden, the infirm, to padlock and shutter your business premises, your house, to find a home for the family cat and dog, 24 hours. It didn't have the impact it might have done. Only approximately 100 Jewish people, mainly residents and traders within the vicinity of Grant's army in northern Mississippi, was actually, were actually evicted. The main reason for this being that the communications between Grant's headquarters and his outposts of military command were extremely poor. Isolated at the farthest point of his advance down the Mississippi Valley with the capture of Vicksburg as his goal, Grant's columns were continually harassed by Confederate cavalry. Under the dashing and deadly leadership of Nathan Bedford Forrest and Earl Van Dorn. There were also swarms of contraband slaves that caused extra headaches of administration and supply. To top it off, less than three days after the order having been issued, Holly Springs was attacked by Van Dorn with 2,500 Confederate troops. 
Holly Springs surrendered. 2,000 Union soldiers were captured. Much cotton and one million rations burnt and 50 miles of railway track destroyed. A major military headache. As well as being surprised by rebel guerrilla tactics, Grant was besieged mentally. He was very aware of swelling criticism from the northern public for his lack of military success. But worst of all, from his perspective, was the incessant need to police the activities of traders supplying his command and to control cotton speculators, including his own officers. President Lincoln himself told a friend that the army is diverted from fighting the rebels to speculating in cotton. Both Grant and Sherman, his, his fellow general, considered all the speculators as leeches. Um, Sherman complained that, uh, sorry, considered all the speculators as leeches, buying up cotton with gold that could be swapped for arms and other essential supplies for the Confederacy. Sherman complained that swarms of speculators and Jews were descending on Memphis the two categories being deemed synonymous. Newspaper correspondents picked up on this bigoted assumption, and Grant, predisposed to believe such allegations, was soon convinced that the Jews were the main culprits. At the beginning of the war, Secretary, Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase immediately halted the shipping of munitions to the Confederacy. But he believed the trade should follow the flag and as northern armies moved southward, treasury agents gave permits to loyal citizens to resume <coughs> normal commerce. Now, this had two um, goals, really. First of all, the textile mills in the north were starved of cotton. They couldn't function because of the embargo and the lack of the ease of movement of cotton. But secondly, which was you know, fairly far-sighted of Lincoln's administration, they were thinking of the end of the war already in 62, which Clearly, despite ups and downs, the North was going to win. Um, and they really wanted to ease the South back into the Union and trying to have trade already sort of up and going to some degree, they felt was going to help that go. Um, so th as the Northern armies moved southward, Treasury agents gave permits to loyal citizens to resume normal commerce. These private individuals flocked to the Union Army-occupied towns. The price of cotton skyrocketed, four times as high as it had been at the start of the war. The whole business of cotton trading rapidly degenerated into an orgy of corruption. General Grant and his generals fumed bitterly about the necessity of tolerating this carnival of greed while trying to carry on the war. Army headquarters was constantly besieged by speculators harassing the commanding general for permits, for permits and even for transportation of their goods. The opinion that Jews dominated the cotton trade of the Mississippi Valley intensified, despite an investigation that identified hundreds of soldiers and civilians who were responsible, engaged in the trade, of which only four were Jewish. Responsibility for many other wartime evils, smuggling, speculating, swindling, and particularly purveying shoddy merchandise to the army, that is, poor quality and ill-fitting uniforms, substandard footwear, malfunctioning weapons, moldy food, all this was blamed on the Jews, whose centuries-old occupations of trader and peddler could be diverted uh, into smuggling and illegal trading. An open letter in Harper's Weekly stated, you, meaning the Jewish people, you have no native, no political, no religious sympathy with this country. You are here solely to make money. Apart from the centuries of memories of expulsion conjured up by Grant's Order Number 11, more alarming was the threat created by such media coverage as the following. 
three Jews had been caught smuggling letters and medicine into New Orleans, past or through the blockade somehow. In February, an article published by the Associated Press actually called for their death. Jews in the South and New Orleans ought to be exterminated. There was one other factor in the mix of Grant's exasperation with having to deal with cotton speculators. His own rather shady father, Jesse R., with whom he had at best an ambivalent relationship, had entered into a secret partnership with three prominent Jewish cloth manufacturers, the Mack brothers, Harmon, Henry, and Simon from Cincinnati. <coughs> in exchange for 25% of the profits, Jesse Grant agreed to accompany the Mack brothers to Holly Springs in mid-December, the fatal day, the 17th, to introduce them personally to his son in order to obtain one of the much-coveted trading permits. Grant was outraged. He refused to provide the permit and dismissed them all, particularly indignant at the Jewish traders who had entrapped his old father into such an unworthy undertaking. Could it be that, as an act of displacement, Grant expelled the Jews rather than his father? <laughs> Later that same day, that evening, Grant received a batch of complaints about the Jewish traders in his war zone, forwarded to him from Army headquarters in Washington. Was there an explicit or an implied reprimand contained therein? We don't know but a frustrated and exhausted Grant, angry at being, as he sought, endlessly distracted from his military duties, hastily penned and immediately dispatched, without pausing for thought, that obnoxious order, which is how his wife used to refer to it later in later years. His own chief of staff, John A. Rawlins, objected to its wording, Jews as a class? Grant remained adamant and said, well, they can countermand this from Washington if they like. We will send it anyway. And countermanded it was by President Lincoln on the 4th of January, less than three weeks from its issue. How did Lincoln get to know of the order? Well, although outside of the northern Mississippi, the order was already at nearly a dead letter, even those post commanders who did actually receive it were puzzled by it and sort of, like good civil servants, wanted to protect their backs and wanted clarification before they implemented it, so they did nothing. Uh, one or two others deserve, our, deserve credit for standing up and saying that it was morally wrong and they weren't going to do it. M most of them didn't get it. Um, so it was nearly a dead letter, but there was one place where General Orders No. 11 was strictly in force, Paducah in Western Kentucky. Now, there had been a, a history of anti-Semitism and, and difficulties, which we, we, don't, we won't go into, but um, this exception, Paducah, Kentucky, the expulsion of the Jews from Paducah brought the whole matter to the attention of the nation and revealed the hatred and bigotry emerging under the stress of war. The New York Times referred to the order as one of the deepest sensations of the war and criticized Grant severely. Some, like the Washington Chronicle, called the Jews the scavengers of commerce. Late in December, the order landed on the desk of Provost Marshal L.J. Wardell at Paducah, who immediately sent official notices to the heads of some 30 Jewish families in Paducah, ordering them out that most of them were long established residents, that none of them were involved in cotton speculation, and that at least two of them had served in the Union Army, made no difference. The families were evacuated by, evacuated by steamer up the Ohio to Cincinnati, almost forgetting a baby in the process. There were two bedridden old ladies who were permitted to remain by heart, behind, but by the 29th of December, Paducah was viewed in the rain. One Jewish merchant refused to take it lying down. Caesar and J.W. Caskell, his brother, and the Wolf brothers sent an indignant telegram to Lincoln, who actually never saw it, 
about the enormous outrage on all law and humanity. And Caesar, not having received a reply, not surprisingly, alerted the press, both Jewish and secular, and headed for Washington in a ride that has been likened, in a journey that has been likened to the ride of Paul Revere. Um, Jews all along his route were alerted and stirred to action, including Rabbi, Rabbi Isaac Meyer Wise um, of Cincinnati, who was uh, very prominent, had a large congregation, and there was a large Jewish community of about 10,000 folk. Wise was also the publisher of the Jewish weekly, The Israelite, one of the two main Jewish periodicals of the time. Now, um, Caesar Kaskill obtained testimonials and letters of introduction introduction along the way, particularly in Cincinnati, which he presented on arrival in Washington on the 3rd of January to Congressman John A. Gurley, who took him straight to Lincoln. The president was disbelieving until he saw General Grant's written order and a copy of the Caskell's order of dismissal from Paducah. Lincoln's amazed and horrified response was immediate. He ordered a countermand of orders, number 11, via his general in chief, Henry W. Haskell. Haskell telegraphed the order to Grant the next day, the 4th of January, and without demur, Grant issued a rescindment on the 6th of January. Apart from its inherent unfairness as collective punishment, the order brought to the surface Jewish fears that their community, following Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of the 1st of January, would see them replace the black, blacks as the most despised minority. As Rabbi Wise suggested, Jews worried that if America no longer split along racial lines, might it not split along religious ones? Ironically, Lincoln had been spending this time preparing to issue the Emancipation Proclamation that freed Confederate-held slaves as an act of justice warranted by the Constitution. The irony was not lost on some journalists. The Memphis Daily Bulletin published the two documents, one above the other, on the front page. A few days later, as, of, as reported by our friend Rabbi Wise, Lincoln told a delegation of Cincinnati and Louisville Jews some of those that Caskell had stirred into action on his way through, and although they knew that the order had been rescinded, they wanted to thank Lincoln in person, so they carried on. And Lincoln said to him, said to them, that he feels no prejudice against any nationality and by no means will allow that a citizen in any way be wronged on account of his place of birth or religious confession. To condemn a class is, to say the least, to wrong the good with the bad. I do not like to hear a class or nationality condemned because of a few sinners. From start to finish, the whole incident took just under three weeks. And the Jews of the enormous department of the Tennessee returned to their homes and businesses. Nine years later, in 1871, Paducah, Kentucky, where wartime tensions had so dramatically erupted in the expulsion of its Jewish families, elected a Jewish mayor. Lincoln's prompt cancellation of the order diminished greatly the fear of the Southern Jews that the Union victory would precipitate them into the very anti-Semitism that they'd fled from in Europe. The Northern Jewish community had stood beside the Jews in the South and had publicly petitioned their government to revoke an order by its most popular general in the midst of a war, and the president of that nation had agreed. The promises of their new land as the protector of minorities were not just empty words on paper. Now, the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction, Reconstruction has been called America's second founding. The national debate that took place as the country sought to rebuild itself defined what America was to become as a reunited nation and who we, the people, should actually include. This conversation was, of course, primarily concerned 
with the future status of the vast freed slave population, about four million people. But the discussion also addressed the Americanness, or otherwise, of groups including Indians, Chinese, and even gypsies, of whom there were a few. But of course, the largest non-Christian community was the Jews. At less than 1% of the population in the mid-19th century, it expanded rapidly from about 15,000 in 1840 to about 150,000 at the outbreak of war in 1861. And by the time of the 1868 presidential election, nearly 200,000. About 25% of the Jewish community lived in the Confederacy. As these statistics imply, many Jews at this time were new immigrants. Investigating the causes of the surge in anti-Semitism during the war, we need to understand that not just Jewish immigration, but the mass <coughs> immigration of the 20 years before the war created social, economic, and political strain. Between 1845 and 1854 alone, that's nine years, nearly three million largely German and Irish newcomers swelled the US population by 14.5%. The resentment of the Native Americans, now we use Native American today in a different way, but what was meant then by Native American was basically uh, descendants of the original settlers, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, who squabbled like mad amongst themselves anyway, um, for the culture, language, and religion of this massive influx uh, led to religious rioting. From the mid-1830s to 1850s, from Maine to Texas, 20 Catholic churches were burned, and natives, nativist groups, such as the Know Nothing Party and the American Party, <laughs> Yes, it does have resonate a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> Reached a peak in the mid-50s. Now, immigration ebbed as the slave controversy grew before the Civil War. They weren't connected, those two things. It just happened that the peak of immigration had been, been reached and now is being replaced by the controversy over, over the slaves. Um, but the religious stereotypes continued to be newspaper fodder. Of all the immigrants, Jewish immigrants were very visible. Language, dress, culture, and the tendency to settle in large groups and cities. There were very few Jewish farm boys who immigrated, but also the very success <coughs> and prominence of a few enforced the idea of the Jew as a permanent foreigner. Like black Americans, their distinctiveness defined them. Two examples of prominent and successful Jews at that time are Judah P. Benjamin from the South. Now, he was your quintessential uh, Louisiana gentleman and dandy, um, highly successful lawyer, very, very competent. He was originally the first Jew in the US Senate representing his state of Louisiana. And then when Louisiana seceded, he turned over his talents and his ambitions to Jefferson Davis and became his attorney general, and then his secretary of war, which he was exceedingly bad at. So Davis kicked him upstairs and made him secretary of state. But he continued all throughout this to attract um, attention because of his Jewishness. The label never left him. And he was known when he was secretary of state as um, Judas Iscariot Benjamin, and the Jewish puppeteer behind Davis. The other example to give you is in the North, um, where although German-born New York financier August Belmont did not associate with the Jewish community and married his daughter to Admiral, his son, sorry, he married Admiral Perry's daughter and raised his children as Episcopalians, his enemies always reminded him that he was a foreign born Jew. Now, in the immediate aftermath of the issuing of General Orders Number 11, Grant remained completely silent, both publicly and privately. Despite receiving numerous letters from Jews, and although attacked in, attacked in both the Jewish and non-Jewish press, 
He also, he escaped being censured by Congress, so he didn't have to appear publicly uh, to defend himself in Congress, and neither he nor Lincoln suffered any political embarrassment. Not until the 1868 presidential election did he publicly deal with his past action. The American Jewish community then, targeted by democratic, the Democratic Party's attempts to harness the Jewish dismay over the explosion of anti-Semitism during the war, including Grant's carry-on, were caught up in a huge dilemma. Should they give their support to the national hero who had brought the Civil War to an end and who was publicly committed to peace and reconciliation? Or should they reject Grant as an enemy whom many considered a modern-day Haman, committed to the destruction of the Jewish people? In other words, did they vote as Jews or as party-affiliated Americans? Grant's nomination as Republican candidate raised for the first time since the founding of the US the idea of a Jewish vote. And the question of a candidate's alleged anti-Semitism became a central political issue. Mass meetings by Jewish groups in many states were held, including one in Memphis, where, it was argued, the only position that Grant deserved was the one occupied by Haman in the last moments of his career. America had never witnessed such a public display of power on the part of the Jews. Now, there had been two previous incidents where there had been some protests, but it wasn't very effective. In 1840, there were a few low-key meetings in support of fellow Jews in Damascus. And in 1858 and 9, they joined in more strongly in a worldwide campaign to save Edgardo Mortara. Now, while it's impossible to know how many Jews voted against Grant because of number 11, the evidence from letters to the press is that most Jews supported the candidate of the party of their choice. The memory of that obnoxious order continued to haunt Grant up until his death in 1885. He apologized for the order publicly, eventually, and repented of it frequently, privately, some Jews having heard him in private lament and regret what he had done, although he deliberately did not mention it in his memoirs. One writer has said that for Grant, the 17th of December, 1862, marked a point where every day after that date was Yom Kippur. Immediately after his election as 18th President of the United States, Grant permitted a private letter he had written to be handed over to the press, Rabbi Wise being the first to receive and publish it. Now, he had written it during the election campaign, but he had, which I think is to his great credit, refrained from having it, letting it become public. Now, whether it would have made any difference or not, because it was quite late in the campaign that he wrote it, but anyway. In it, he unequivocally distanced himself from General Orders Number 11 and forswore prejudice. I do not pretend to sustain the order. The order was issued and sent without any reflection and without thinking of the Jews as a sect or a race. I have no prejudice against sect or race, but want each individual to be judged by his own merit. Order Number 11 does not sustain the statement I admit, but then, I do not sustain that order. It never would have been issued if it had not been telegraphed the moment it was penned and without reflection. Once he became president, Grant proved a friend to the Jews and helped them hugely by refusing to support a proposal by the National Reform Association that would have rewritten the preamble of the Constitution to declare the United States a Christian nation. Now this had been brewing up for a long time. Lincoln refused to support it when he was president and in both of Grant's um, terms, he refused. Now had he endorsed it, who knows? You know, the Constitution, the preamble may well have been, been rewritten. Um, Jews held more government offices under Grant than ever 
they had done both at home and abroad. He supported them in the controversy with the ASPCA, ASPCA about alleged cruelty and slaughtering of animals. His uh, appointments included Edward Salomon as governor of Washington Territory, David Eckstein as consul in British Columbia, Herman Bendel as superintendent of Indian Affairs in Arizona, and he offered the post of Secretary of the Treasury to his friend Joseph Seligman, who did not take it up. Grant's oldest and most fervent Jewish supporter, Simon Wolf, was appointed to the post of Recorder of Deeds for the District of Columbia, a minor and unglamorous post, but one that gave him continuous access to the president. No previous president had ever appointed a Jew to so high a position of trust, and none before Grant had wanted to have a Jew in his administration to represent his co-religionists. Because Grant had said when he had appointed him, he said, I want you to report to me on all matters. You know, what do your co-religionists think about all the various issues of the day? I want the opinion to come from you. Wolf calculated that at his request, his meaning Wolf's, Grant had made more than 50 appointments of Jews to public office. The same Simon Wolfe, leading a delegation from the B'nai B'rit Lodge of Washington, D.C. in 1869, urged Grant to intervene in Russia's attempt to enforce a czarist UK's expelling 2,000 Jews from the Bessarabian frontier. Now, this was legal by Russia's standards because the edict said no Jew was permitted to live with in 50 versts, seven and a half miles of uh, an international border. But it wasn't the Jews who had moved, the border had <coughs> moved as a result of the end of the Crimean War. So what could they do? <laughs> um, this was totally contrary. Now, the um, Simon Wolf's delegation trying to interfere in a foreign country's internal affairs was totally contrary to tra traditional US policy of non-intervention in the internal affairs of other nations. This is before the Monroe Doctrine, okay? As formulated by former President James Buchanan. It was also opposed strongly by Grant's cabinet led by Secretary of State Hamilton Fish. And perhaps it was even contrary to Grant's own self-interest. Did he really want to bring up the subject of Jewish expulsion? As far as Americans were concerned, Russia's cancellation of the expulsion was due to their own public outrage led by Jewish protest and the president's indirect intervention through America's ambassador to Russia. There was also another incident, but. I won't go into it because it, it would take too long. In Romania, there was something very similar, but in that case, Grant, um, from 1870 to 1876, he appointed a San Francisco Jewish chap called Peck Soto <coughs> to be consul in Bucharest, and he improved the lot of the oppressed Romanian Jews considerably. Um, Looking back on a golden age of progress, Simon Wolfe recalled the Grant years as unique, having known every president from James Buchanan to Woodrow Wilson, he said, President Grant did more on behalf of American citizens of Jewish faith at home and abroad than all the presidents of the United States before or since. Now Grant was a product of his time. He was completely, um, filled or surrounded by the common image of the Jew as a Christ killer, a usurer, a shrewd businessman. This acceptance of stereotype probably made Grant susceptible to the belief that the Jews had been the chief offenders in the debacle of the cotton trade during the war. But his working out of his repentance by his helping so many Jews to obtain public office or political appointment, his personal friendships with many, make it understandable that Grant denied that he was ever an anti-Semite. While still in office in June 1878, Grant made history by attending <coughs> the dedication of Adas Israel 
the first Jewish house of worship in Washington. And he was the first president to ever attend a ceremony, ceremony like this in a synagogue. And so, what could be more fitting than that a reform rabbi, E.B.M. Brown, known as Alphabet Brown, because not only did he have three initials before his surname, but he used to sign every document with about 18 different academic qualifications. Um, uh, so E.B.M. Alphabet Brown was asked to be one of the honorary pallbearers at Grant's funeral. In Grant's last illness, many Jewish friends and clerics had come to his house to pray for him. And Brown, having been a representative of the Jewish people at the funeral, visited the tomb on Riverside Drive to honor his friend the president every year on the anniversary of Ulysses S. Grant's death until 1920. Thank you.